I'm Anne Marie Slaughter, the CEO of New America, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you to today's event, which New America is holding in partnership with the US Agency for International Development on a really critical question. What is the role of women as leaders in the fight against climate change? We are holding this event uh, to celebrate Women's History Month, but also because last month, the IPCC released its sixth assessment report and the contents were genuinely frightening. The report warns in no uncertain terms that humanity, and I quote, has a brief and rapidly closing window of opportunity to secure a livable and sustainable future for all. But the report also makes a critical point. The authors write that the participation of women in decision-making processes, all decision-making processes, can contribute to a more equitable and socially just adaptation to climate change. Especially at the local level, women can be agents of change to enable both increased gender equity and climate resilience. And I wanna emphasize that, that gender equity, increased gender, gender equity and increased climate resilience go hand in hand. So at present, we know that climate change creates significant and unique challenges for women and girls in the developing world, and it, that it threatens global prog progress on gender equality. You just have to think about the role of women as farmers in so much of the developing world, the role of women having to get uh, firewood or other ways of, for cooking and heating, uh, and how climate change, drought, floods affects those activities. It disproportionately impacts women. It limits their educational and, and uh, economic opportunities. It harms their health and well-being and it increases the risk of violence against them, against them. At the same time, investing in women gives us an opportunity. It's women who are spearheading efforts with households and their communities to prepare for and adapt to climate shocks. And women leaders are stepping up to, to address climate change at the local, national, and international level. Studies show that when women are engaged as decision makers, in climate change planning, and I would say in all planning, their communities do a better job of adapting and managing to cli managing climate impacts. I'll just say that this panel is wonderful for me to be able to introduce and to host the fireside chat, because 10 years ago, when I was the director of policy planning uh, at the State Department, we worked hard on, on cook stoves, on improved cook stoves that had a climate impact and an impact on increased security for women and increased health for women. This kind of work is just as central as any of the diplomacy that we do and frankly, the defense uh, that we do. It is also uh, at the core of what New America is calling people and planet-centered politics, that we need to be thinking about the impact of all of our actions on individuals and on, on the on planet in everything that we do. So to celebrate and to recognize the 66th session of the Committee on the Status of Women, I'm joined by Gillian Caldwell, USAID's Chief Climate Officer, and Jamila, Jamila Biggio, uh, USAID's Senior Coordinator for Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment. We are going to discuss the nexus of climate change and gender equality and how we move forward in centering women as leaders to fight against the impacts of climate change. We're going to chat for 30 minutes and then I'll give the floor to USAID's Carol Boudreaux, who will then moderate a panel discussion on the many ways that women are leading solutions to critical land, natural resource and climate change, uh, climate change challenges globally. So Gillian and Jamila, welcome. Uh, and thank you so much for joining. Pleasure to be here. Likewise. I want to start with a question uh, to both of you to, to kind of establish a baseline. A crucial climate-related goal for USA, USAID 
is to enable and to empower women to lead on climate change, just as we've been discussing. Can you talk a little bit about why this is such a priority uh, for USAID? Gillian, I'll start with you. Sure. Well, first, you know, my thanks to you, Anne Marie, and to New America for, for co hosting this event with USAID and um, really for giving us yet another chance to spotlight the importance of women's empowerment uh, in the CSW. Um, our administrator, Samantha Power, has uh, often said climate change is sexist, but our response shouldn't be. And by that, she means that uh, we know that climate change has a disproportionate impact on women and girls, and yet uh, women and girls are central to advancing action against climate change. So when it comes to our strategy, we have a central goal to ensure that we empower and enable women as climate leaders, because they best understand from firsthand experience uh, what, what these impacts are and how to address them on the ground. Um, we also recognize the importance of elevating women's voices in these processes because they are, of course, well positioned, not just to speak to the concerns of women, but we know more likely to hone in on the equitable and just dimensions of the climate crisis. Um, I mentioned that climate change is sexist. And, and what I meant there was that uh, women and girls are significantly more likely to be killed by natural disasters than men. And the stronger and more intense the climate event, the larger the gender gap between men and women's mortality. Um, there's, there's one example of a cyclone that hit Bangladesh in, in 2007 and deaths among women outnumbered men by five to one. Is that so, because men can escape more? I mean, what, what causes that? Well, there's many dimensions. I mean, there are, of course, factors pertinent to strength, um, but women will also likely be uh, in, worse, in worse condition economically. They'll also be responsible for tending to the larger family, some cases children in tow, which, which uh, complicates escape. Um, and uh, so they find themselves on the front line in situations like this with many fewer resources to, to respond to the problem. That is, I, 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 I mean, I love the line, climate change is sexist, but our response doesn't have to be it. And I don't love the condition it describes, but I think it does really capture exactly what we're talking about. So Jamila, let me turn to you. Great, thank you so much. Um, as you heard from Gillian, um, our our agency's response to climate action is recognizing that to be successful, we need to empower half and, and amplify the efforts already being led by half the population to advance solutions to the climate crisis. And that builds on work that we do across the gender quality and women's empowerment space in any sector. Because um, take your problem, if you tap the contributions um, and unlock the full potential of half the population, then we're going to see um, greater success and greater um, progress towards the goals that we've laid out together as a as a global community. Uh, and when you, it's it's a theme we see right now on Ukraine, um, for example, that we want to be clear and support the role that women are playing on the front line. So as we're gathering today, um, certainly kind of reflecting on the importance. Um, as women are seeking refuge across borders, as they are organizing the resistance within the country, that women are on the front lines, they have been, and we must continue to stand with them. And that's a theme, that's a, a, um, a position that we at USAID and the US government have taken across crises, that we must stand with women and girls everywhere, striving to create a better world, um, and we must do more to support them. So that's something that as we, again, look across our commitments to gender equality and women's empowerment, we see the climate crisis as one of the paramount crises that we must together support mobilizing and amplifying the work of uh, women and girls around the world. That's something that the US government's first ever national strategy for gender equity and equality uh, has, has, has identified as one of our anchor priorities. Climate is explicitly one of the areas that we as a government are focused on when we look at the intersection of gender equity and equality 
and uh, what we want to see happen in the world today. Um, and that's, you know, building on what Gillian shared, we know that women are already leading climate change solutions in their communities, even if they don't always have formal recognition or formal power to do so. We know that um, as we look at how important adaptation and mitigation are to help secure economic growth for the future, we know that we have to consider half the population in that. What are women's contributions to understanding, adapting and designing climate solutions that actually meet the needs of their communities that respond to the roles that women have in gathering water and firewood and farming and um, all of the ways in which they are already supporting their communities, they have ideas about how to adapt those, those efforts to actually address climate change successfully. Thank you. Please. You know, it, I, I, I was, as I've watched, as we've all watched the events in Ukraine, it's really been an interesting measure in some ways of, of increased gender equity. In other ways, it's more traditional roles and, and exactly women as refugees who, who are, are more at, at risk. But watching women you know, join the civil militia in various cities, and I find myself asking, would I have the courage to do that? I hope so. You know, I, I, I've certainly fought for the, the ability of, for the armed services to be open equally to all. Uh, but at the same time, you see uh, women, you know, on the front lines feeding, right? Feeding is just impo as important as fighting. In fact, the Russian supply lines are broken, uh, which means they can't fight. And of course, so you see women in, in all roles, uh, and both with a gun uh, and, and cooking and organizing, as you say. I also just want to point out from what you said that I often wonder, what would it be like if we never mentioned women, but we just said half the population every time we were talking about these issues? You just sort of wonder how people would, would take that. But Gillian, let me come back to you. You're the lead uh, on climate change more broadly. And I'd like to ask you to set the stage for the audience on what USAID is doing as part of the larger US government strategy to re-engage with climate change. Everybody knows we've rejoined the Paris Agreement, right? John Kerry has been visible and his climate diplomacy at the COP has been visible, but there's a lot of stuff that is not so visible. So let me ask you to describe that broader context and we'll then come back to women. Yeah, so it's a, it's a new day in the US government when it comes to action on climate. Um, and USAID is taking really an unprecedented whole of agency response to the problem. And that's because we see that climate can either imperil or fast track any of the goals that we, that, that we hold dear when it comes to um, our role as the International Development Agency for the US government. Um, Another uh, quote I like to um, reference from Administrator Power is that uh, we are a climate agency, by which she means not that we will do nothing but respond to the climate crisis, but that if we look at every single objective we have, whether it's health or education or economic empowerment or biodiversity, we know the climate crisis is um, got to be front and center in terms of how we consider and advance our response. So we've set our most ambitious uh, goals ever, including reducing uh, carbon emissions by 6 billion tons by 2030. That's the equivalent of all US emissions in an entire year, protecting 100 million hectares because we know nature-based solutions will be critical, um, catalyzing $150 billion in public and private finance because the IPCC says we need $5 trillion a year by 2030. So this is a very ambitious set of goals we've established for ourselves uh, by 2030. And as I mentioned earlier, women are going to be central to our um, ability to deliver and thus are central to our strategy in responding to the climate crisis. Um, we have a number of relevant programs. Um, one is um, actually in partnership with the IUCN, who we'll be hearing uh, more from today, the agent program, Advancing Gender in the Environment. Mm -hmm. And the goal there is to increase gender equality in climate and the environment sectors. 
Um, so this is tailored support to uh, countries to develop climate change gender action plans connected to their national climate strategies to assist them in designing and implementing gender responsive climate action. Um, we've also, uh, we're funding uh, RISE, which is Resilient, Inclusive, and Sustainable Environments Grants Challenge to address gender-based violence in natural resource management sectors, because we know that gender-based violence increases in the context of climate threats. Um, there's another mechanism, and by the way, if there's any donors on the line, we always uh, welcome collaboration with respect to these initiatives. GRIP, the Green Recovery Investment Program. So USAID is looking to invest 250 million over five years to attract 10X in private sector investment, 2.5 billion for climate adaptation and mitigation with women again as, um, as, as leaders in the effort. So very exciting times and we should be launching our uh, final climate strategy uh, that'll take us through 2030 next month. That, that, that is remarkable. I also, I'm smiling only because uh, anyone who goes to Washington, the first thing they have to do is master the acronyms and you've got some good ones. Uh, and I will also highlight your point about partnering with IUCN, uh, somebody who, who I spend a lot of time arguing for a broader paradigm of global politics that includes governments and all global actors, whether they're civic or corporate. And I know USAID is, is doing a lot of that, that we have to marshal our resources in every direction uh, to be able to, to do this. And again, there's so many women in the civic sector uh, in the global South uh, and, and around the world. So thank you. Uh, I'm gonna ask uh, Jamila the same question, but with respect to gender, because it's also a new day in the US government with regard uh, to gender and indeed, the president's budget request includes the largest amount ever for gender equity, uh, for uh, 2.6 billion, which really is real money. Uh, so what does that mean for the way US aid projects actually scale impacts for women and girls? Uh, and for, again, for US aid's work in the climate gender context. Great, thanks so much. So yes, on March 8th, International Women's Day, we announced that the forthcoming budget for uh, the next fiscal year will include 2.6 billion to advance gender equity and equality around the world. It is the largest ever. It's double the amount we requested in the previous year. Uh, so it very much um, reinforces uh, the, that we are truly putting the resources behind the, our values here. We are committing um, investments to actually advance gender equity and equality to um, finance the national gender strategy that I that I referenced before and to truly take this work forward. Uh, so these resources, USAID will be taking forward the vast majority of these resources um, and they will be dedicated um, to uh, advancing um, women's leadership, addressing gender-based violence, ensuring that half the population can fully contribute to all of the sustainable development goals that we have around the world, including climate change. So as, um, as Gillian noted, um, as the administrator thinks of our agency as the climate agency, then a key uh, element to that is ensuring that we are investing in unlocking how women can contribute and are contributing to climate solutions. So that will certainly be an area that um, where these resources will be dedicated either through standalone programming that's focused on um, the role that women are playing in climate solutions or looking across all of our adaptation mitigation work, um, our broader responses to the climate crisis and recognizing that within each of those areas, what are the roles, what are the experiences, what are the barriers that women and girls are facing with all of their intersecting identities? So women and girls in indigenous communities around the world, women and girls in um, communities um, of LGBTQI plus or uh, communities of uh, disabled communities, looking broadly across all of these intersecting identities, youth, Certainly, yeah. as we talk about um, advancing climate solutions, it's critical that we are supporting the amazing leadership of youth leaders around the world, including adolescent girls and young women. Another area that we're really focused on in this space is uh, a just transition and looking at the green economy. 
And there it's really critical that we are looking at um, how are women participating in that green economy? How are we supporting and ensuring that they have access to quality green jobs, that they are supported as entrepreneurs in climate smart natural resource management? Uh, so again, these resources, we are, we are developing our plans now of how we'll take them forward, but it will include attention to women's leadership uh, in advancing solutions to climate change. And that's such a positive vision. I mean, that work on climate has to balance between the really terrifying prospects that the IPCC outlines for us, but we also know that fear is is not a great motivator uh, when when you, when you feel so helpless. Or uh, so this this vision of women as entrepreneurs in the green economy that women can leapfrog to a new generation of energy and products of all different kinds and not just be leaders in in uh, adapting and mitigating climate change but economic leaders as well i find that a, a wonderful vision gillian you mentioned gender-based violence uh and this is again one of the darker sides here uh of the but also often a hidden side to the problems we face and you've spoken really eloquently uh about uh the about gender-based violence uh, and and also the particularly the gender-based violence uh, that land and environmental defenders face exactly these women who are organizing to defend their land to defend natural resources so i wondered if you'd talk to us a little more about that yeah, so the organization i used to lead called global witness has been documented documenting the killing of earth and land rights defenders for many years and between 2002 when they first started documenting those killings and 22 uh, there were over 2000 documented killings of earth and land rights defenders and of course there have been many many more but um, those killings need to be um, you know, visibly attributable to their work defending um, the land that they live on um, or the environment that they care for. Um, many of those uh, people killed are women. A disproportionate number are indigenous people. Um, you may recall the killing of Berta Caceres in 2016, a remarkable leader, uh, Lenka, indigenous leader in Honduras. And um, what many people don't know is that Berta faced multiple death threats. I think she had received more than 17 death threats by the time she was assassinated in broad daylight. And she continued to fight for the land and the way of life that she was seeking to preserve. Many of these women, these brave women, are standing up against powerful companies that are threatening the survival of the planet and their, their culture as they know it. And in many cases, these companies are working in close coordination with the governments. Um, the paramilitaries may be mobilized to um, you know, to, to intimidate and to abuse um, people that are standing in their way. And women, women really experience uh, the lion's share of the verbal abuse, the, the threats, um, the media campaigns, uh, many times, you know, being challenged for breaking gender norms or, or even for being out of their homes. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's just incredibly important that we recognize that climate change is not just an environmental problem. It's the largest humanitarian and human rights crisis we've ever faced. And if we don't look at these issues in a comprehensive way, including the mining of green minerals, over 21 of which incidentally are now being mined to power our solar panels, um, you know, we, we will be reiterating a lot of the problems of the fossil fuel age. You know, it's interesting, women are socialized to be rule takers, right? Good girls, rule takers, and men are socialized to be rule makers. But what is extraordinary is how many women then become rule breakers, right? That they are the ones who are willing to simply challenge the system uh, and in with, with extraordinary uh, courage, uh, and even in the, again, in the face of tremendous violence. And you see that in the United States as well, when women lead uh, investigative journalism against big corporations, but of course they're more, even more vulnerable around the world. 
So Jamila, last question. I could talk to you for both of you for, for an hour, uh, but I wonder if you'll tell us just in closing, talk to us about the perspectives uh, that women have uh, on local resources and food security and household and community needs. There's a, you know, we're, a lot of us are talking about the lived experience of the people at the center of our policies uh, and New America focuses on people-centered policy. There's a, a wisdom there that is often not tapped. And I wonder if you'd leave us with some of the, some of the insights uh, that you've seen. Yes, happy to. Um, it is, so here's some of the things that we are focused on. Um, first, as you look at uh, reducing the risk of disasters, um, look at early warning systems or other ways to anticipate um, climate disasters, that's an area where we see women and girls um, having distinct perspectives from the roles that they are playing um, as they collect, uh, as they collect water and firewood, as they collect, as they farm, et cetera, they um, can provide different signals um, of potential risk uh, that we need to be tracking. We also are looking at um, in urban areas um, that as these are vulnerable to flooding and other climate risks, uh, that women have perspectives on um, what they need in terms of affordable housing, in terms of infrastructure and services to actually help um, make these urban areas more resilient. We also know with economic opportunities that um, as we look at where the entrepreneurship opportunities are, what's happening in industries as they um, adapt, that women have um, distinct perspectives on what, where the jobs are, what the opportunities are, um, and where they can contribute uh, to, to the green economy. They also um, are identifying where there are specific uh, risks that women and girls are facing. Um, so we are um, partnering, for example, with Utsche, an indigenous-led organization in Guatemala, um, where they are recognizing where gender-based violence um, and uh, gender norms that are limiting the roles that women can play, how that's affecting how indigenous women in their community are fully participating in advancing climate solutions. So they are laying out solutions to that and identifying how can, how can with our support, they help create more space for women to engage on the front lines in their indigenous, in their indigenous communities to, to address the climate crisis. Um, we also see that with, um, in, in Congo, we support a women-led local Congolese organization called ASEFA that is um, focused on artisanal mining, mining in Eastern DRC. And they are looking at this intersection of gender-based violence and environmental degradation. Um, but across the, across the chain, what we see is that um, women leaders are advancing these solutions and they are calling for our support. Um, and that's something that we are trying to do more of at USAID, whether it's in around land rights, it's around Red Plus, around sustainable farming, conservation, artisanal mining, truly across all of these spheres. If we are recognizing in all of these areas, there are women-led organizations and women leaders on the ground already advancing solutions to these that just need our support to help um, amplify their work. Thank you, thank you. And indeed, I was just talking to a graduate student in history who was looking at the history of mining in England back in the 17th and 18th centuries, and women were miners, right? We often think about mining as the ultimate male occupation requiring strength and, and all sorts of uh, things that we associate with traditional male roles. But in fact, that is not historically true. Uh, and women can, can reinvent the ways we do those things. So Jamila Biggio and Gillian Caldwell, thank you. Uh, we've kicked off our morning, uh, I think, in, in style. I just want to close by saying all of us are looking at the headlines uh, and aching for what is happening in Ukraine. And what is happening in Ukraine is in many ways the classic paradigm of interstate politics. One state invades another. It's a classic 
example of great power competition uh, and conflict. And so people think, well, that's the State Department and the Defense Department. But what we are also seeing are the role not of, of people on the ground who are supported by places like USAID, but also by business around the world, by civic groups around the world, by citizens groups, Ukrainian uh, Ukrainians in the diaspora, but also non-Ukrainians who want to help. And those are global actors, and they have a huge impact on what happens in this war uh, and also, of course, what's going to happen afterwards. So when we think about people and planet-centered politics, we, of course, think about the relations between states, but we increasingly think about what, what impacts people and what people can do, particularly where it's around saving the planet. And I'll end by saying, we'll know that we're there when USAID has equal weight with the State Department and the Defense Department. And so much of the work that you are doing uh, is in the service of that goal. Here so you, here you, Anne. <laughs> so with that, I thank you both. And I'm gonna turn the, the mic over to Carol Boudreaux. I'd like to welcome everyone from wherever you are for joining us today. We're so glad to have you as we transition to the second half of our panel discussion. We are so grateful to Anne-Marie Slaughter, CEO of New America, uh, to Gillian Caldwell, USAID's Chief Climate Officer, and to Jamila Biggio, our Senior Coordinator for Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment, for kicking off this important conversation. Um, in the previous fireside chat, we heard how USAID is already addressing the climate gender nexus through our programming. We also heard about how and why USAID is centering our climate work on gender equality and inclusion. And we heard a bit about um, our efforts to partner with women to lead on climate action. And now I'm really so pleased that we have the opportunity to hear from three women who are doing just that leading their organizations and leading efforts on climate action. Um, we'll be speaking for about 40 minutes and then our time after that, we'll have some time for questions and answers. And so I did wanna remind the audiences with us today, if you have questions, please send them in either through the Q&A or through the chat. Uh, after the Q&A, we'll close out very briefly, um, but without any further ado, let me turn the floor over now to our panelists. Uh, really, Johani, Solange, Bandiaki, Baji, and Tracy Farrell. I'll provide a very brief introduction to each, and then we'll start this second uh, section of questioning. So um, we're going to be joined today by Really Johani. Really has worked for over 25 years to improve the management and financial sustainability of marine protected areas and to reduce the use of unsustainable fishing practices in Southeast Asia. She's co-founder and executive director of the Coral Triangle Center, a learning center of excellence on coastal and marine resources and resource management based in Bali. Really um, previously worked for the Nature Conservancy and she holds a master's, a master's of science degree in tropical marine ecology from the University of Leiden and a master's of science in tropical coastal zone management from the University of Newcastle upon Tyne. Um, also, interestingly, uh, really has extensive diving experience in the Netherlands, the Mediterranean, the Caribbean, and the Asia Pacific, and in Asia Pacific. Next, we'll be joined by Solange Bandiaki Baji. Solange is the Rights and Resources Initiative Coordinator, and she's president of the Rights and Resources Group, which serves as um, the Rights and Resources Initiative, or RRI's coordinating mechanism. Solange, um, in this capacity, supports a global coalition of over 150 rights holders organizations and their allies, and they're dedicated to advancing the land, forest, and resource rights and livelihoods of indigenous peoples, local communities, and Afro-descendant peoples, and particularly the women within those organizations. As the ROG president, Solange leads the staff in Washington, D.C. and Montreal. She was previously senior director for Africa and Women, Peace and Security at Partners Global, and she worked with the UNDP gender team in New York. Solange holds a PhD in women's and gender studies from Clark University and her master's degree in environmental sciences and philosophy from Sheikh Anta Diop University in Senegal. 
And finally, we're so pleased today to have Tracy Farrell joining us. Tracy um, is Regional Director at IUCN. She has 20 years of experience developing, leading, and overseeing global conservation and sustainable development initiatives and programs. For the last 16 years, Tracy has been working for Conservation International, where she designed and oversaw CI's first global freshwater and ecosystem services program. And she led the Greater Mekong program from CI's regional office, which is based in Cambodia, and designed and implemented Conservation International's Asia Pacific conservation and fundraising strategy. Most recently, she's created and been leading a team that's working to enhance project design and quality across a whole portfolio of projects that are valued at over $500 million. Tracy's PhD is from Virginia Tech in forestry, and she has technical and policy experience in freshwater and ecosystem services, protected areas, biodiversity conservation, and conservation finance. So I think you can see we have quite an illustrious panel with us today. So welcome to all of you. Um, as we just heard from our previous panelists, there are many ways women can lead solutions to climate action. So I'm going to ask you briefly, can you please tell us what solutions you and your organizations are focusing on and why? And I'm gonna start with really. So really tell us about the solutions you are focusing on and why. Um, for the Coral Triangle Center, uh, CTC, uh, we very much focus on uh, building the capacity of uh, local communities uh, to care for the oceans. And when I started about 30 years ago in this field, it was a, an extra challenge because um, a lot of the uh, focus and attention uh, in countries like Indonesia was on the forest, but not so on the oceans. Uh, despite the fact that you know more than 70 percent of the earth's surface is covered by the ocean and indonesia is the largest archipelago in the world there was not much attention for uh, marine and uh, coastal marine issues and um, as a young woman at the time um, there were not many women working in this field of marine conservation let alone uh, diving across the country to look at high highly uh, diverse areas um, and see whether they were uh, appropriate for marine uh, protected areas. So over time, I see, you know, I learned a lot uh, myself about um, engaging uh, communities uh, in this uh, plight for the oceans, and particularly also uh, women. And more recently, there has much has been much more focus on uh, women engagement in multinational initiatives like the Coral Triangle Initiative. Uh, between six countries that harbor the most diverse coral reefs in the world, including Indonesia, Philippines, Malaysia, Timor Leste, Papua New Guinea, and the Solomon Islands. And it became very clear um, that engagement of stakeholders, and particularly women and uh, youth, in this um, initiative would be pivotal for its success. So, a few years ago, uh, with support from USAID, we developed facilitated a women leaders forum a very informal network uh, with representatives of women across the six countries that worked uh, very well in terms of engaging uh, women at the national level but also at the community level and the the key uh, lessons learned that we found is that besides um, you know technical training we focused on in the earlier years it was pivotal to actually combine it with the leadership training as we also heard from the previous panelists, that uh, building um, you know, self-confidence among the women, but also um, you know, building trust, uh, effective communications were key ingredients for women to engage in decision-making processes, as well as um, getting more um, economic empowerment uh, opportunities at the same time. So they could actually uh, get respect in the village, but also engage therefore in decision-making processes uh, at that level. So a combination of um, leadership skills and economic empowerment was for us um, a key way moving forward in engaging women, particularly in the marine sector as more than 50% um, are actually involved in um, fish processing activities and are pivotal for uh, achieving sustainable fisheries, but also other 
uh, issues like climate change would be uh, very important um, to have women involved as well. Thank you. Really, thank you so much. That's um, so interesting to hear about. And thanks for calling our attention to the role that oceans are playing in addressing climate change. So Lange, let me turn to you and ask you the same question. Um, what are the solutions that you and RRI are focusing on now with regard to climate and, and why are you taking, why are you focusing on these solutions? Over to you, please. Thank you, Carol, and very glad to be part of this uh, timely conversation. I would like to share some lessons learned from the RRI coalition. And as you mentioned in the introduction, we uh, work with indigenous communities, Afro-descendant community, and women within those uh, communities. And we do have like great networks of indigenous and community women who are doing many and diverse, playing many and diverse role into uh, like the fights against uh, climate change. And as a result of the multiple roles uh, they fulfill, they play unique and vital roles in the maintenance of uh, biodiversity and the reduction of uh, carbon emission. And uh, speaking from a conservation perspective, we know that indigenous and rural women's active role in forest-based labor, they're involved in agriculture. And also they depend on biomass energy. And all of that make them key stakeholders in effective environmental management related to climate change uh, mitigation. Another aspect is that as managers of community forests, indigenous and community women often bear the re primary responsibility for gathering timber and non-timber forest product, and such as food, fuel, traditional medicine, fodder for livestock, material to make uh, clothing, and other cultural uh, item. And even during uh, the devastating pandemic, we have seen women stepped up to lead and protect their land and forest from uh, degradation and harm. And here I would like to share like, you know, a case study from um, the Nawalpur district in Nepal. And we have one of our RRI's um, partner, Feko Fund, uh, who are doing uh, very great work, women over there in, in Nepal. So in that district in Nepal, the Nawalpur district, indigenous women worked together throughout the 2021 20, uh, monsoon season, planting lime trees on over 25 hectares of government and privately owned farmland, and also restoring degraded lands through uh, horticulture. And throughout the lockdown, these women cultivated and cared for mature lime trees to ensure a productive harvesting season. Their traditional knowledge of land has drawn the government's attention in form of grants and financial subsidies to scale up their lime and pickle production. So what can we learn from that example? Is that when we support initiatives that are conceived and implemented by women themselves, we allow them to lead instead of just being bystanders in climate solution. I think it's very important to recognize those kind of uh, different roles that they play. Alange, thank you. That's a really excellent example from Nepal and appreciate you pointing out um, that when we let women lead and bring their voices and their knowledge to this to the table, we see solutions that can be more sustainable. So thank you so much for that. All right, Tracy, let's turn over to you and ask the same question briefly. Can you tell us what are the solutions that IUCN is focusing on now with regard to the women climate nexus and, and why those solutions, please? Thank you very much, Carol, and thank you very much to the organizers of this event, New America and USAID. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here, and I'm thrilled to represent IUCN and, and share with you some of our work today. So a bit of history, perhaps, of who IUCN is, in case folks don't know. It's a rather interesting organization, a union that includes members, it includes commissions, it includes a council. And, and really, it's, it's the oldest and largest environmental organization that at its core for many years, around 15 years, has, has really focused on, on gender and we have a human rights-based approach. And the overall, the overall objective is really to ensure diverse women and men's unique priorities and needs are understood and addressed. And we're looking to gender-responsive strategies and plans 
And this is how we aim to shape climate action and also engaging women at the core of the solutions. Because we all know that, that women are undervalued, unseen, when sadly they really are at the core, as has been mentioned, of many of the solutions that need to be pursued for, for climate resilience. So the way IUCN approaches this is through a series of field projects. We work in more than 63 countries and also through a very exciting partnership that I wanted to highlight with USAID that Gillian mentioned, the AGENT project. So this is the Advancing Gender and the Environment project. And it's a 15 year partnership that we're very thrilled to be pursuing together. And we're aiming to work globally to build knowledge, tools, provide technical advice. And, and the assumption is really that, that these tools are critical for integrating gender into our work to address climate change and tackle environmental crises because we recognize that we can't leave behind anyone, in particular, half the population. I love how Anne-Marie said that we might look at this differently if we said 50% of the planet was left behind rather than talking about women. So Agent focuses on, on three areas. There's the idea of knowledge products and really trying to address key sectors and topics, fisheries, energy, sustainable landscapes, and we've had a large amount of access of these, of these knowledge products over 130,000 times. Then the second area is focused on influencing policy and programming. So we're making the case that gender matters. And there's been more than 200 requests from governments, NGOs, multilateral institutions, and, and academia. And the idea is really to try and get access to what are the best ways of integrating women and women's needs into policy and programming. Then lastly, the partnership is looking at tailored tools. So these are trainings and tools that are developed for, for USAID, IUCN stakeholders, as well as our own staff. And these are really help, helping to change the way that gender is understood and integrated into environmental policies programs, governments, and practice. And, and thus far, we've developed more than 26,000 of these kinds of various, various packages of, of trainings and tools for a variety of our stakeholders. And then lastly, I'll just mention, that, and Gillian mentioned this as well, as well, the Resilient, Inclusive, Sustainable Environment Initiative, which is really trying to incorporate specific needs related to addressing gender-based violence. Thank you. Tracy, thank you so much. Um, it's great to hear from all three of you how you and your organizations are standing with and empowering women. Um, and this is so important because we know women are so are disproportionately impacted by climate change. Uh, for example, we, we know that the UN estimates that 80% of those people who've been displaced by climate change are women. So I wanna um, come back to you with a question, which is what, what can we do to make women more resilient to the impacts of climate change and how can we ensure that they aren't disproportionately affected? Um, Solange, I'm gonna turn this question to you first. Thanks, Carol. Um, maybe just to raise two, there are many things that we can do, but I would like here to raise uh, two uh, like important uh, issues. One is to say that to harness communities' climate change mitigation potential, we must ensure that the tenure rights of indigenous and rural women are secure. So the tenure security is very key because without secure tenure, women will not be able to play their role that they're playing in climate change mitigation and adaptation. And without their tenure security, they are also more vulnerable to uh, the climate change uh, shocks. And the second, I think given the necessity of securing women's tenure rights at a global scale to advance the climate uh, agenda, we need tools to measure the extent to which women's tenure rights are recognized in national laws. And as you uh, all likely know, the SDG indicator 5A.2 is on the proportion of countries where the legal framework, including customary law, guarantees women's equal right to land ownership and control. And just to mention that at RRI, uh, we uh, developed an analytical framework and related database that can be used to measure such progress in, with respect to women's right to community forests. 
And I think those uh, that database with small adjustment, it could be applied to all community land uh, more broadly. So just to mention that, yes, we there are actions that we, we need to do, but we need to start really measuring, documenting, and showcasing them. Solange, thank you so much. Point very well taken, and land is near and dear to my heart. Uh, so I appreciate you shining a light on that issue. Um, really, uh, I know a whole lot less about oceans. Um, so I'm going to turn the question to you, and maybe you can help us to understand what can we do to make women more resilient to the impacts of climate change with regard to engagement around concert, ocean-oriented conservation? And how can we ensure that women aren't disproportionately affected by changes that we're seeing in the oceans, for example? Really, I'm gonna have you come off mute again. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, uh, thank you for this. Um challenging questions, especially for the oceans. Um, women are very much involved in, um, you know, fisheries activities. Um, we also engage them more and more in um, helping to set up and enforce uh, marine protected areas in Indonesia and the Asia Pacific region. But uh, what we see and what is pivotal is to really uh, build the capacity uh, of the women to actually be able to participate um, in um, decision-making processes, but also in implementation of uh, any uh, activities related to issues like uh, climate change, uh, plastic pollution, um, fisheries, everything is exacerbated in a way at this stage uh, on the site. So they need much more information, but also more confidence. And what we have recently done is also to actually bring the women uh, to the field and for the first time, they could actually uh, snorkel and swim among the uh, coral reefs. They often process the fish, but they actually never seen a coral reef in their life, although they actually live nearby um, coral reef areas, mangrove areas, and so forth. So just to introduce them to the uh, coastal and marine ecosystem and explaining um, the benefits and the need to protect those uh, critical ecosystems for our uh, own livelihoods, um, for uh, food, food security for the protection of the coastline and so forth. Uh, we see that um, it inspires the women and really um, give them the motivation to actually do something about it. And in combination with, again, um, empower, uh, economic empowerment, uh, it's a very powerful formula. For example, in one of our sites, um, we engage the women in seaweed cultivation and they make um, special snacks from seaweed uh, that we can sell in the domestic markets. But giving them access to markets uh, and to the skills that they need to do this, uh, they can actually improve their own uh, livelihoods, uh, build their own confidence, and uh, really engage much more in village processes and decision making. But it's the combination, again, of um, providing them the, the technical background and visualizing um, the marine ecosystems for them in combination with economic empowerment that is really uh, showing a great impact uh, on the ground. And they influence their families and whole villages with their um, uh, commitment uh, to marine conservation. And uh, with the Women's Forum in the Coral Triangle, we also recognize the women uh, on the ground uh, for their uh, work and just that recognition and um, providing them small incentives to carry on with that work um, gives a lot of impact uh, on the ground. And so we love to get uh, women more connected across the region and, um, you know, support each other uh, and share lessons learned, which is also a great way to um, accelerate and scaling up um, the best practices in this field for marine conservation. Thank you. Really, no, thank you. That was, that's so interesting. Um, and I think the idea of overcoming some barriers to bring women actually into the space in the coral reefs is such an interesting way to engage them. So really, really interested to hear that approach. Um, Tracy, let me ask you what, from your perspective, what do you think we can do to make women more resilient to the impacts of climate change and, and what's the IUCN doing on this front? 
Thank you. Yes, I, I think uh, as has been said, uh, we really need to get at some some of the core issues of what limits women's participation in in solutions. So part of this is shifting gender norms, and, and really we have to address this at at all levels. So this is something that uh, the way IUCN works, we work with communities at the ground level, we work with local governments, national governments, all the way to international policy making. And some interesting trends have sort of emerged through the agent project. We've learned that quite a few of the nationally determined contributions, so the way that countries determine how they want to address and mitigate climate change, many more of those revised plans are starting to include gender considerations. So that, that's quite exciting. We found recently that almost 80% of the revised plans are starting to include gender in some way. So these are some really good examples where at the policy level, you can start to see some of these issues addressed in tackling climate change that ideally then filter down and, and trickle to local and community levels. Then, then I think we also really need to, we can't forget about adaptation as well and make sure that adaptation plans and strategies are heavily inclusive of the diverse need of, of women and, and girls. And in particular, they're often at the forefront. And as was what as was mentioned, sadly, often the most impacted, greater death rates. So making sure that they are factored into adaptation decisions is, is also critical. Then lastly, I'll also mention, as Solange mentioned, the idea of land rights. So land ownership and access to land is, is often a, a barrier. So if you don't own land, you might be precluded from accessing finance or other kinds of resources to help implement climate change solutions. So really being able to, to make sure that this is not a barrier, but rather there are other options made available to women so that they can engage in things like climate smart agriculture and bring differentiated needs to the table and expertise so that they're able to employ those solutions equally. Solange, earlier you mentioned the role that um, secure land rights can play in addressing climate change action. Um, I want to ask you to, to focus in a little bit on the unique role that Indigenous women can play in this fight. I know that RI does a tremendous amount of work with your partners and your um, network organizations that are uh, supporting and representing Indigenous people. So can you tell us a little bit about the unique role that Indigenous women are playing in this fight? Yes, thanks, Carol. I think maybe I may raise uh, two examples. One is the role um, that women play in influencing policies, lawmaking and decision-making processes at the country level when there are new laws and policies that are being uh, drafted. And as we all know, I mean, women legally own less than 20% of the world agricultural land. And when it comes to Africa, for example, 50% of land and forests legal framework do not contain community level provisions specific to women. So in the DRC, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, RRI have been uh, asked active there for more than a decade. And we have been working with one of our uh, uh, collaborator organizations uh, called CEFLED. CEFLED is a national coalition of women and promoting gender justice and uh, women's um, empowerment in the DRC. And what they do is they, lead that coalition, investing in creating spaces and of political dialogues between women and government officials, customary chiefs, and the men in their communities. These dialogues generate data and knowledge that women can use to influence uh, legal land use and community forestry policies that affect them. And CEFLED's effort to let the creation of gender-sensitive laws and policies that recognize local and indigenous women in the DRC the Democratic Republic of Congo just uh, adopted its uh, land policy and it has good provisions of regarding uh, women's land rights, so which is really key. But it happened based on the advocacy that women's organization do on the ground. They organize themselves, right? They strategize and they also know how to engage with key stakeholders to make sure that women's land rights are uh, taken into account uh, within new laws and policy. 
Another example that I would like to uh, share is uh, from Peru. And in Peru, one of our uh, partner organization is uh, ONAMIAP, which is the Peru's national organization of indigenous Andean and Amazon women. So it's an organization uh, campaigning for the right of Peru uh, indigenous women. In Peru, 43% of men take part in community rulemaking activities compared to just 22% of women. And that's where ONAMIAP comes in. So they work directly with community leaders to raise their awareness of gender inequality and women's contribution to land and resource governance. They also conduct sport person training to build leadership capabilities of indigenous women. They equip them like, you know, to occupy governance position within their communities and to advocate for their right more broadly. So they also participate in national and international climate change discussions where they raise awareness of gender justice uh, issues among policymakers. So just here to show how women are engaged, not only at the local level within community structures, because also that's where changes can be made. At the national level where decision makers, policymakers come up with new laws and policy, but also the international level, because we want it or not, the international level is still very uh, elite women dominated. How can we make sure that indigenous women, community women can participate in those climate change debate at the international level? How can we elevate their voice at the international level? And I think those are the type of actions that right now we're seeing how indigenous and community women's organization are really becoming very powerful and also strategizing and engaging at different levels and uh, at different, uh, like, you know, with different stakeholders. Solange, thank you so much. I think um, we had a lot of interest in your response and the particular grassroots examples that you were able to bring to us today. Um, but you also, at the end of your comments, pointed to the role that um, national level and international level actors and fora uh, can play to support and raise women's voices. So, Tracy, I want to turn back to you and note that um, in your role at IUCN, you're coordinating relationships with the US government and with multilateral agencies and other environmental institutions. So I wanna ask you, what can the US government and larger environmental organizations do to center and empower women, particularly women in developing countries to lead climate action? Over to you, please, Tracy. Thank you, thank you very much. Yes, we're seeing that there, there is a huge number of opportunities and I mentioned before some of the work with AGENT where we've been really trying to dig into the nationally determined contributions and how those are being done. But, but we're also really trying to figure out kind of how the differentiated knowledge can be included and what that looks like in other policies. So there we've been doing this work called gender climate change gender action plans. And these, these are really uh, proving to be quite effective ways of trying to include gender from the get-go. So at the very beginning, how nationally can countries look at mitigation and adaptation and really try and include this in a comprehensive way so that the appropriate indicators are developed, the policies are in place. And again, these also link to the international commitments that are made as part of the NDCs, but also really scaling down into local communities. And, and there's also a role in this for indigenous traditional knowledge as well. So being able to make sure that, that land and other natural resources are being appropriately factored in and managed and, and taking advantage of that specialized knowledge, which, which as we know often gets forgotten. And interestingly, we've seen some things uh, also through the agent project where we found that female parliamentarians. So if you have women decision makers that are policy makers, they tend to make policies that are more inclusive of the environment. So this is, this is data, this is information and facts that really shows us that if you do include women at the, at the core of, of climate change and other environment decision making, those decisions are, are more inclusive, but also are better for the environment. Then I'll also mention one other study of almost 300 forest groups in Bolivia, Kenya, Mexico, and Uganda. And similarly found that women who dominated those groups 
They were more inclusive. They didn't exclude uses of other natural resources, things like fuel wood collection. And they actually tended to focus more of those less, less damaging practices like fuel wood versus timber harvesting. So, so these are some of many examples. And we hope that through work like with the agent project, proving some of these things through data, and then working directly with policymakers to try and ensure that that environment and climate change solutions are gender inclusive. So this, this is kind of the approach that, that we try to use. Um, I'm gonna actually stay with you, Tracy, because you raised an issue earlier that I think is important for us to just flag. And that's, um, can you share with us what you think are the most important barriers to women's leadership on climate action? And mm. what should we be doing to overcome these barriers? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, so we know that gender-based violence is a massive barrier, and I haven't mentioned that probably enough in my comments this morning, but, but really, if, if we don't address this, we're going to sadly probably fail in our other efforts. And, and climate change, as we know, is a serious aggravator of, of gender-based violence. So we've seen this, sadly, we've seen this demonstrated through research, and COVID certainly also has added to this. But one example of something we've seen is child marriage has been increasing. And, and so this is a direct stressor related to the fact that resources are scarce, climate change is worsening this, this phenomena. And, and so this is, this is one of a few indicators that we can see that's, that's really pointing to a worsening situation. Uh, and then I think other barriers are legal, customary, and sort of sadly typical gender norms that um, that onto themselves act as, as barriers and really limit women's ability to participate equally in, in decisions around land and resource management and also climate change mitigation and, and adaptation. Then we're also seeing issues around um, kind of gender norms and reproductive and care responsibilities. So this is also limiting women's capacity to, to engage in climate action. So I'm mentioning a lot of these, these barriers and, and challenges, but I, I think again, the, the solutions are gonna have to come from this combined on the ground community action empowerment level, but also making sure that these, this information and this thinking is included in the national policy making and, and again, linking back to international priorities and, and, and change. Thanks, Tracy. So very much taking a systems approach to solving, solving and addressing the bar solving the problems and addressing the barriers. Thank you. Um, really, I'm going to ask you to come off mute. I know that you have been engaged in activism around marine conservation since you were about 10 years old. So for since you were a, a younger girl, do you have anything you'd like to add to this? Um, question about what are the key barriers and how that women face in a becoming leaders of climate action like you have? And um, what do you think we can and should be doing in addition to the good ideas and, that you shared with us about CTC? So let me turn the floor over to you, really. Uh, thank you, Carol. Um, yeah, if I look back on my own experiences since I was young until now, um, I think it's... Um, you know, the, the barriers we encountered, especially, you know, uh, when we were younger uh, and also in a sector that wasn't so well known um, like marine conservation at the time. I think it's um, very important um, to really um, invest in your own uh, leadership skills. And I think uh, having uh, mentors along the way that can help you uh, build those leadership skills and confidence are uh, quite critical in, in moving on in your career and, and um, getting on with uh, with the work. And so uh, we translated that, for example, in CTC and also for the Coral Triangle Initiative into um, uh, a mentor program, particularly also between sort of an intergenerational approach uh, to uh, link uh, senior um, women leaders with young upcoming leaders to really, um, you know, uh, help the young leaders um, in this in this space, and uh, we've seen that this was a, a very um, workable model for uh, the Coral Triangle Initiative, and we developed a training module that is now 
uh, adopted and replicated across the six countries. And having um, a special policy in place, a gender equality, social inclusion policy for uh, the six countries, it will also help uh, set up structures and budget allocations to support uh, women programs, for example. And particularly in relation to climate change, we're looking at uh, particularly um, uh, coral restoration, mangrove rehabilitation programs where women can play a leadership role. And right now, um, Timor Leste and the Coral Triangle Center are co chairs for the Women Leaders Forum. So, in the next few years, we really hope to uh, build out those systems and scale up um, the the women leadership program and the women leaders forum for those six countries but it's very much based on my own experience to really invest in the women leadership uh, qualities so they can actually become uh, great champions in their own right wherever they are in their community in their institution or uh, at the international level so yeah i would love to give that message in this forum thank you Thank you for sharing that message, really very much appreciated. Um, ladies, we're coming towards the end of our time for discussion. So I'm gonna ask one last question and ask you to briefly share with us, um, as you look around the world and as you look around your communities, who are the women that are inspiring you? And very briefly, what gives you hope that we can achieve the needed uh, climate action? So really, let's just stick with you. So who's inspiring you and, and what's giving you hope today? Um, well, I was very much inspired by Sylvia Earle, who's a you know, well-known uh, researcher and scientist from the US and was early on very much a champion for uh, deep sea research. And having her as a role model at that uh, level was, was great for us aspiring uh, marine biologists at the time. And um, yeah, I think also the community, the women leaders, you know, on the ground with very little resources, they can achieve so much. And every time uh, we meet those women, uh, train them and learn from them as well, it's a great inspiration for, for us on a daily basis. Thank you. Thank you so much, really. Um, Tracy, why don't I turn to you? What, who's inspiring you and what's giving you hope? Thank you. I think uh, all of the indigenous women leaders who are putting themselves on the, the forefront and the environmental defenders and, and Gillian, Gillian was mentioning some very, very trying examples that we know of women who've sacrificed their lives for, for conservation and, and trying to be on the front lines of protecting their families and making sure that they can survive and thrive under a changing climate. And I'm, I'm reflecting also on a story of, of women that I used to work with in Cambodia who agreed to set aside a certain amount of their savings in the interest of, of really trying to, trying to better their lives, but doing it in a way that also taught financial management. So all of the different strategies and the funding was used for only for efforts that could be shown to really help improve fishing, help improve maintenance of households to produce better fish products. So it was this nice link between generating income, understanding financial management, and also making their lives better, and then learning how to deal with climate resilience on the side. So there's so many, I'm inspired and hopeful because there's so many projects and efforts like that that are underway, and, and we might not hear many of these stories, but they're out there. And I think if we could just scale those up and do more of them, then ultimately we can get there. That's great. Thank you, Tracy. All right, Solange, last word on this part of the conversation for you. Who is inspiring you and what's giving you hope? Well, as part of my work, every day I'm inspired by um, indigenous and community women around the world, mainly from the global south, just knowing their struggle and how they uh, contribute to climate change mitigation and adaptation. But I would like as part of this inspiration to uh, make a call to action and just to say that to forge women's empowerment worldwide, government and donors must urgently make funding available and accessible to indigenous, Afro-descendant and local community women's organization in countries in the global South 
who have been historically like under supported and underfunded. And just last point, and the reason why it's very important to provide that funding directly to indigenous and uh, local women. As most of us don't know, indigenous women's organization receive only 0.7% of all recorded human rights funding between 2010 and 2013. And despite the role they're playing in managing, conserving community territories, and they comprise like, you know, over 50% of the world's land and forest. So here, these are facts from report um, that have been uh, made. So I think it's very important at this point, as we are talking about women's leadership role, which is great, we all know it, but how can we strengthen that leadership role is to provide them with funding and make sure that they can do the work that they do every day to uh, preserve the environment and to conserve biodiversity. Solange, thank you so much and appreciate getting the information in the chat so that folks who are watching and interested can take a look at the, um, the materials. So we have just over 10 minutes left. We're gonna to turn to Q&A now, and I'm gonna start with a question uh, that's focused on challenges in Brazil. So um, we'll go across the panelists. If anyone would like to address this, uh, you are more than welcome. And the question is, can the panelists speak to the intensifying deforestation of the Amazon and the intersectional harm of President Bolsonaro's land grabbing, uh, anti-indigenous and pro-deforestation legislation that is pending before Brazil's parliament? Um, what are your organizations doing to address this issue? Not to respond directly to that question, but to uh, mention and raise the fact that indigenous women in the Amazon are playing a key role into conserving uh, the forest, into preserving biodiversity. And uh, like I said, they are the steward of what is uh, really like, you know, what needs to be done to preserve the environment. But I think Tracy mentioned uh, during uh, her presentation that at the same time, they have been, they're being killed because of the work that they're doing. How can we make sure that also we provide the needed support to those women human rights defenders or women that are land rights defenders who are risking their life to protect the Amazon? So I think that these are really like, you know, it requires multiple types of actions. But again, we need to support women within their struggle and within their role. I think that's what I need to say. And of course, political will is uh, very important. And uh, without that, also it's very hard to implement the climate change uh, uh, and Paris uh, Agreement. And just maybe to say that, you know, for the realization of the Paris Accord goal, the SDGs and the 30 by 30 goal and all the development objectives, uh, it will not be achieved if indigenous and rural women do not have secure right to control, manage, and access community forest land and resources. And I think that applies also to, to the Amazon. In the marine uh, sector, we, we try to uh, empower um, communities that have traditional marine tenure systems um, in Indonesia, for example. And um, you know, building on those systems, we can actually quite effectively manage um, coral reef areas, for example, uh, they have already centuries old uh, systems to close off certain areas to help replenish um, the coral reefs uh, around their islands. And so I think, um, you know, especially in remote areas uh, in the ocean uh, for remote islands, uh, that type of approach is quite pivotal and critical in countries like Indonesia as well, just as a comparison for uh, Brazil. Really, thank you. I think that was a really nice uh, comparison point. And, and the next question I think builds really well, very nicely builds well from the previous question. Um, that is, how do you support women who are leading solutions to climate action in places where there is limited political will or where the enabling environment is weak and not likely to support women's engagement? Um, really, maybe I'll stay with you and ask you to consider that. Do you have experience working in places where there's limited political will? And what steps did you take to help um, encourage women to become involved in conservation activities in those kinds of environments? Please. 
thank you, Carol. Um, yeah, we do have those situations, particularly in, again in remote islands. And what we do is invest in um, women groups um, that have um, a certain organization. Uh, we provide training and uh, we provide them also um, small grants to actually, uh, you know, carry out specific activities. For example, in this case, coral restoration, we, um, reef rehabilitation, and um, you know these small grants go um, a long way, and they often find a way to continue um, those activities in different ways. So, investing directly in women groups on the ground uh, in remote islands, um, we found that a very successful formula. Thank you. Thank you, really. Um, Solange, let me come back to you investing directly in organizations that are doing grassroots work uh, was something that you had called out just a moment ago. And you also noted how challenging it can be to operate in places with limited political will. Is there Are there any additional thoughts you'd like to share about how you can support organizations working under those conditions? Just to a second what really I was saying, the need to make sure that the funding goes directly to uh, the women's organizations on the ground. I mean, we always play an intermediary role. And I think they are at the point right now where they can have access to funding and they can do work on the ground. How can we support them in that? But also I think another important aspect is the need to change the narrative because we always see indigenous women, community women or local women as victims. Of course, they are victims of climate change. We all know, and we are always doing our work to make sure that you know, they are less vulnerable to climate change. But at the same time, they are leaders. They're playing a leadership role into managing the forest. They're playing a leadership role in climate change adaptation and mitigation. How can we focus on that leadership role and make sure that they are seen as the leaders, then they are the one who could do the work we always talk about capacity building, but I think they do have the capacity. It's just how can we support them better to reinforce what they're doing on the ground? So I think that also the change of narrative is uh, really key. And another aspect, the last one is how can we make sure that the policies in place, the progressive one are implemented? implemented. We do now have a critical mass of like, you know, national laws and policies that recognize women's rights, uh, like you know, to land, to resources, but implementation is still lacking. How can we support women organization? How can we work with government officials to make sure that those new laws and policies are implemented and reflected on the ground? Solange, thank you so much. Um, I think you've given us a call to action towards the end of, the, of our time together, a let's change the narrative call to action, which uh, I appreciate and I agree with. Um, so we are just about out of time, and I wanted to take a few moments and just sum up where we stand at the end, where we are at the end of this conversation. Uh, to me, it seems like the key takeaways from our conversation are that we can stand up. We have three women leaders with us who've been standing up in their careers to build up, to support, and to empower Women, yes, for sure, but also local communities around the world to address challenges associated with um, a changing climate, the really harmful disparate impacts that come from a changing climate for these particular communities. So as Solange uh, nicely put it or, or encouraged us to think, let's change the narrative and let's recognize that these women, that these women around the world at the grassroots level, at the national parliamentarian level, at the international level, can all be working together along with men and boys to drive climate action. Um, I'd like to take a moment now to thank our co-host today, New America, uh, for, for joining USAID to support this conversation. I would, of course, like to thank the panelists who've been here with us today. Solange Bandiaki Baji from RI and RG, really Johani from the Coral Triangle Center, and as well uh, Tracy Farrell from IUCN. What a pleasure it's been to be able to spend time with you today and to hear what you're doing in your organizations to address these important challenges. I'd also like to thank those of you who joined us today in the audience for um, 
for taking a part of your time out of your taking time out of your day to be here with us to share this conversation and to weigh in with your questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions, but we're really pleased to have had your time and attention today. So uh, with that, let me thank everyone for being here. Thanks to panelists, thanks to participants and wishing you a good morning, afternoon or evening. Thank you so much. <laughs>